Good morning, folks, and welcome to our service. It's great that you can be with us, uh, those here, All Saints, Nowra, um, and around the world on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, welcome to you. Jeff was just saying we've got um, uh, people logging on from Nairobi, would you believe? So there we go. So a great welcome to you. Uh, we're delighted that you can join us this, um, uh, as we gather around God's Word and uh, this Palm Sunday, that day when we reflect upon Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, I guess the start of Holy Week in that sense of uh, Easter next weekend. That's a scary thought, isn't it? Where's the year gone? Yikes. Uh, my name's Bruce and I'll be leading us through this service uh, this morning. And I thought I might just uh, start with uh, uh, reading from, one of the, from the Psalms, Psalm 33, and the psalmist writes, Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. And you might say, well, why would we do that? Well, the psalmist answers that in the next couple of verses. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. That's the great God we're here to worship. So let's do that now by singing our first song.
Take a seat. Perfect. We are the people of God, and the scriptures remind us that we still sin. We fall short of God's standard, and we need to confess our failures. So let's take a quiet moment and bring before God those things that we've done that have not been pleasing to him. So let's just take a moment to reflect on, on the week past. Let's say this confession together that comes up on the screen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you know our hearts. We thank you for forgiveness through Jesus. Forgive us for being intolerant and impatient of others rather than loving and gracious. Forgive us for being envious of others rather than serving and encouraging them. We return our hearts to you and ask you to cleanse us and renew our hearts by your spirit, that we might live as your people of grace. Amen. And our God fulfills his promises and is true to his word. We confess our sins. God has forgiven us because Jesus died for us. Amen. Uh, time for the kids uh, to head off to their program. Uh, and I'll just uh, pray for them as they head out. Lord, we pray for our little ones now. Be with them, we pray. Keep them safe. And may they know more clearly of your love for them by what they learn today. And be with their carers. Give them wisdom and compassion, we pray. Amen. Sorry, I almost took it for granted. Uh, now's a moment to chat to one another. Say hello to those around you.
Okay. It's good to catch up, isn't it? Will you pray with me? Our Lord and Father, we ask that you would hear our prayer. Today we give thanks for the lifting of restrictions and ask that you continue to help our nation in the fight against the coronavirus. We ask that your Holy Spirit, who comforts us, would comfort all who have suffered loss and those who have been affected by the floods. We pray for recovery for the state after the floods, Lord. We give thanks for the emergency services who work tirelessly to help their communities in times of a disaster. We ask for resilience for those who have lost family, homes and possessions and for the long road ahead to recovery, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would help us to submit to authority in accordance with scripture. We give thanks for our AGM last Sunday and pray for all those who have taken on roles of leadership in our church, especially our wardens and parish council, Lord. And we pray that you would bless them with wisdom and understanding as they lead us yeah, in the next chapter of this church's life, Lord. We give you thanks for yesterday and for the men's convention. And we pray that um, yeah, your word was heard by many and it was taken to heart by all the men that were there, Lord. We give you thanks for the coming week, Lord, as we approach Easter. Help us to remember all that you did for us. Finally, Lord, we pray that you would raise up your people, Lord, to go into the world and to proclaim your gospel. And we pray all these things in the name of your mighty Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first Bible reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 12, beginning at verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realise that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised from him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am my servant also will be. 
My Father will honour the one who serves me. Uh, please stand and uh, let's sing before the throne of God above. Continuing on in the Gospel of John from verse 27 to the end of the chapter. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. 
We have heard from the law that the Christ will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. The man who walks in the dark does not know where he is going. Put your trust in the light while you have it so that you may become sons of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts. So they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Yet, at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved praise from men more than praise from God. Then Jesus cried out, When a man believes in me, he does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. When he looks at me, he sees the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. As for the person who hears my words, but does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I do not come to judge the world, but to save it. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him at the last day. For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Hi everybody, what a beautiful day it is today, isn't it gorgeous out there in the sunshine and to be in church, to be able to sing without masks, oh it just feels so wonderful to be gathered together as the church on this day, I'm so thankful, what a, what a great day it's been already and um, what I'd like us to do now as we do each week is we spend a bit of time together looking at God's Word, the Bible together, we've had it read for us. And one of the, the roles that I have in the church is to be given the opportunity to, to work with you and explain it. So that's what we're going to be doing now as we look at John chapter 12 together today. So if you've got a Bible with you, I'd encourage you to leave it open to John 12. We're going to look especially at verses 12 through to 26 together today. That'll be the section for us to have a look at. But as we do that, let me pray for us. So will you join me in that too? Uh, our loving Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this gift of a beautiful day that we've been able to enjoy. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together as your people to remember the Lord Jesus, uh, to encourage one another, to read your word, to learn more about who you are and what you've done for us. We thank you for that great blessing and privilege. And we pray that as we spend a bit of time now in John 12, that your spirit would be at work, guiding us to truth and strengthening us and enabling us to live this out uh, in, our, in, our, in our week and in our life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, folks, very few of us, uh, I'm pretty sure very few of us, ever get the chance to see our life turned into a TV documentary. Am I right? Pretty sure none of you guys have had that opportunity. But I imagine that if you could, for example, watch your life on the television and look at all the decisions that you've made in the past, you'd probably see a few clangers along the way. You go, oh, I shouldn't have done that then, shouldn't have said that, but yet there it is for a global TV audience. You'd probably feel pretty awkward and make, might make you think some of your life choices. But there is a TV documentary series called Up. It's called the Up series, and it's been running for over 50 years, and its job is to 
um, show where people are up to in their life every seven years. And so it began over 50 years ago. Some of you guys watched this show and uh, with a bunch of seven-year-old school kids living in England and the TV camera crews asked all these kids, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And some said, oh, I want to be an astronaut. Others said, I want to be a jockey. I want to be a missionary. They had all these grand ideas. And then every seven years, the TV cameras would turn up again and find out what's gone on in their life, what's gone right, but also what's gone wrong. This is an example of one of the guys from the show. His name is um, Neil. And Neil, if you've, if you've watched the series, um, you'll probably recognise Neil. He's kind of one of everyone's favourites. And he was the kid who was happy-go-lucky, always skipping around, enjoying life. And he wanted to be an astronaut when he grew up. Um, but as, we t- as it turned out, he actually went from this really easygoing, happy life to having a lot of terrible things happen to him. So um, by the time he gets to 21 and 28, he's actually homeless. He's, he's, he's a recluse. He's living out in the north somewhere. And um, then he has this amazing transformation. His life turns around. He has a go at politics, as you do. And eventually he ends up back in his church. He's a lay preacher in his church and... His, his life has really done this full turnaround. It's an incredible life story. But as I was reading about him early this week, I was reading an interview that he did, and some words that he said really, really struck me. And I want to share those words with you this morning. He said this, People tell me I'm portrayed as triumphing over the odds. But I see my life ultimately as a failure. I've failed in almost everything I've tried to do. What a, what a devastating way to feel about your life, to sum up your life like that, to feel as if you've failed in all the things that you've tried to do. And not only have those feelings within you, but to have that translated onto a global audience. Can you empathise with him a little bit? Maybe you've felt a little bit of that about your own life. If you go back over all your life's choices and you consider all the decisions you've made and you imagine them being displayed on a global TV audience, perhaps there are moments where you would feel very sharply that you have failed as well. And that's one of the things that this TV show does is it makes you think about your own life choices as much as you look at someone else's choices. Are we on track? Have we done the sorts of things that we wanted to do when we were little? And what exactly is it that we're supposed to accomplish in this life anyway? These are really important human questions. But as God's people today, as Christians, we actually have so many different opportunities, don't we? We have so many opportunities. We can do many different things. We can become teachers. We can become astronauts. We can become missionaries. We can go into politics. We can raise our families. In that sense, there is tremendous freedom for us as Christian people. So many different things that we can do. But yet, as Christians, we also know that there is a very sharp and a very precise direction for our life that God wants us to follow. And and Jesus talks about it in this passage today. In fact, he says that whoever serves him, whoever serves Jesus, must follow him. Whoever serves him must follow him. So what that means for us is that we are to be bakers and hairdressers and engineers and pharmacists, musicians, politicians, that all follow Jesus. Teachers that follow Jesus. Mums and dads that follow Jesus. So although we have great freedom, we also have a very precise edge in the way that we are to live. And I wonder, do the choices that we've made reflect that reality in our life, that calling to follow Jesus? I want to show you why this is so important from John chapter 12 today. So two points from this passage as we work our way through it. First of all, Jesus the King, and secondly, Jesus we follow. Let's have a look. Uh, first of all, Jesus the King, from verse 12 onwards. Now, one of the things that we know about, about kings, and perhaps one of the first things that strikes you about the idea of a king is a king's authority. 
A king gets what they want. A king is in charge, and you know it, because if you ever meet someone who's a king, I, I certainly haven't had that chance, but let's just say hypothetically that you had a chance to meet a king, I reckon the first thing you'd be thinking about doing is, how do I bow? How do I, you know, curtsy? And you definitely want to make sure you do the right things. Say the right things. Make sure that you get the protocol exactly right. And in this passage, we meet Jesus the week before his death, and he's pronounced as the king. He is the king. And he's about to enter into his city, Jerusalem, for the Passover festival. And the Passover festival was an annual festival that the Jewish people held, and they would, they would celebrate it, and many thousands of people would gather from all corners of the ancient Near East, they would go to Jerusalem, they would celebrate the Passover festival, they would gather for worship. And you might think of it, you know, something similar today, it might be something like New Year's Eve. Remember New Year's Eve, like the annual pilgrimage everyone makes to the foreshores of the Sydney Harbour, where they, you gather with your mates and you welcome in the new year and you see the sky lit up. You look at the bridge and you see what sign is going to be painted on it this year. That's our together moment. Passover festival was their together moment. And so as Jesus enters into Jerusalem, the message that we are to understand, the words that are lit up on the harbour bridge are, Jesus the King. Jesus the King. That's how we are to understand what's happening here. And there are four clues in the first few verses that show us that this is precisely what we're supposed to understand. First of all, notice the palm branches. We've got palm branches in here, don't we? Yeah, they look very nice, don't they? Here they are, decorating day for Palm Sunday. But notice what the crowd does when they find out that Jesus is coming. Verse 13, we're told they took palm branches and went out to meet him. Now, palm branches, are, they look lovely, don't they? they they're pretty things. They uh, maybe even make you feel a bit peaceful. Um, but what is it that palm branches are supposed to symbolise? Well, palm branches, as they were used by the crowd back then, were not for decoration. They were not to promote peace. The palm branch was a symbol of how the Jewish people wanted to be independent of Rome. It was a nationalistic symbol. It was their desire for them to govern themselves. It was a rebel symbol. I'll give you some examples. There's plenty of these out there these days. A few weeks ago, there was an incredible archaeological discovery found. You guys see some news on the telly about archaeological discoveries? An incredible archaeological discovery. They found some new Bible fragments from the Old Testament in these, in these caves. But included in these discoveries was also this cache, cache, cache of coins, of coins that were made by a whole bunch of Jewish rebels around 130 AD. Now, these Jewish rebels were trying to um, gain power for themselves, to be independent of Rome. And what do you do when you're in, into that sort of thing? Well, you create your own currency. And notice what they put on the currency, the symbol of the palm branch. That was their way of stating to the world that they wanted to be independent and govern themselves, the palm branch was a rebellious symbol. And so when the people gather, you know, waving their palm branches, it was a public announcement that their king had arrived. Second thing to notice, the people sing Hosanna, verse 13. Now, Hosanna is a very interesting word. It's, a, it's one of those words that crosses over from different languages. So it starts off in the Hebrew, ends up in the Greek, and now it's, for us it's in the English, and we use it as a word when we sing, Hosanna. Um, but it, the word, when originally when it was found, is, is, means something like the word save, save. And you find it in the Old Testament, for example, in Psalm 118, verse 25. And I think this is what the crowd were actually quoting, by the way, here in John 12. So in Psalm 118, we read, O oh Lord, save us, that's the... That's the Hosanna word. Oh Lord, Hosanna. And notice there in this psalm that it's actually asking God to save them. It's a request. God, will you save us? But here we see the answer straight away. As soon as they ask the question, O oh Lord, save us, comes the response, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. See, God's response when the people cry Hosanna 
is to bring the one who comes in his name. And this is what the people are singing as they wave these palm branches. They don't need to wonder anymore about how God will save or who God will use to save them. The one who saves is in front of their eyes, the one they declare king. Thirdly, they declare him as king. <laughs> it's pretty simple, isn't it? Verse End of verse 13. Blessed is the king of Israel. They see Jesus and they call him out as the king. And fourthly, we notice that Jesus himself enters into Jerusalem on, uh, what is it there? On a donkey. Now, this was a way of Jesus accepting their desire for him to be the king. So the donkey is another symbol. So in the Old Testament, there's a prophecy from the book of Zechariah that says that one day their king would arrive to them on a donkey. But particularly worth noticing here is that we're told in verse 14 that Jesus found this donkey. And that means that he was deciding to do this. When he sat on this donkey, this was Jesus deciding to come into the city as the king. And so these first few verses really make it very clear to us that Jesus is the king. And that's how we are to understand Jesus as he enters into Jerusalem for this grand festival, this annual pilgrimage. Well, we get it, don't we? But for the disciples and the crowd, what we're actually told is that their vision was still a little bit blurry. Look at verse 16. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. So this takes me to the second part of what I want us to look at today. And that is, what kind of king was Jesus supposed to be? The crowd didn't seem to quite understand. The disciples didn't even seem to quite understand. But what kind of king should they have expected? And what kind of purpose does Jesus have for us as this king? Let's have a look at it with me together. Verses 20 through to 26. If you're following along in your Bibles. See, in verse 23, we are told what Jesus said. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, we might read that on its own and think, I can see what's happening here. Jesus has been pronounced as king. He's coming into his city. And now the moment for his glory has arrived. You can imagine it, right? Where's the crown? Where's the protocol? Where's the grand acclamation that this man has arrived in his city to be proclaimed king? You can imagine the parade being presented, the fireworks being set up. But Jesus tells them something different. What did it mean for this hour to come? What would happen in this hour as he is glorified? Look with me, verse 24. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. See, Jesus' illustration is this. We're going to have lots of seeds. If we're going to see a lot of fruit, then something's got to die first. I've never been a particularly good gardener myself. Um, we've had a bit of a crack at a veggie patch over the past few years. But I do know that a coriander seed turns into a coriander plant and that if you let it go long enough, the coriander plant goes to seed and then you get a billion seeds that turn up as a result. <laughs> but the original seed, well, that's long gone. The original seed is gone. That's what Jesus is implying here. He's saying that he needs to be the one who will die in order for others to have life. And that's actually what it means for him to be the king. This is not a king that claims all power for himself and uses that power to serve himself. No, this is a king who uses his authority to serve the needs of others. This is a king who will die so that others might have life. This is what it means for him to be the shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And so he announces that his hour has come. That the hour that's on the way will be the hour that glorifies him. But how exactly is it that the hour of his death would actually glorify him? 
how is that how is that how does that work how are we supposed to see his glory when he is crucified on a cross now we have some idea of this don't we the idea of sacrifice we understand what that looks like and so for example we might see a, a tv news report or maybe read something in the paper about um, a, 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 someone who gave up their life rescuing someone else. You seen those stories around? Yeah, maybe maybe um, rescuing someone from who's drowning, or maybe someone in, on a battlefield. You know, someone who gives up their life because they want to protect someone else. And we see that story and we marvel at it. Why? Because their character has been exposed. Their, the greatness of the individual is revealed by their actions. And so perhaps we can say something about this is going on when we see what happens to Jesus. You see, when he, when, he, when he dies on a cross, we are not just seeing the death of a criminal or the death of a rejected king. No, what we are seeing in his death is his glory and his greatness. But why? Because Jesus' death has a purpose A purpose that affects each one of us. It affects us all. Because when Jesus dies, it is not a death like any other death. It is not the lonely death of a criminal or the death of a rejected king. The death of Jesus on a cross is a substitutionary death. Why? Because when Jesus died on the cross... He took the judgment of God upon himself. And he did that not for his sin, because he had no sin. He was perfect and sinless and pure. No, in that moment, as he took the judgment of God, he took our place and died for our sin. That's why his death was a substitutionary death. He died in our place. And that is where his greatness is revealed. That is where his glory as the servant king, as the redeemer king, is so clearly displayed. And this means for you and for me, for all of us, that the judgment that we deserve by God because of our failures, because of our sins, has been taken away. Because it's already been dealt with by Jesus at the cross. And what's more, this death of Jesus on the cross is not the end. We're told it's actually the beginning, the beginning of eternal life, and not just for Jesus, because his Father vindicates him, but for all whom he rescues by his death on the cross. That is what Jesus does as the King who dies for us. That's his glory, that's his greatness, that's why the hour glorifies him. The primary purpose of Jesus' life was to rescue us by his death. Now, once you see that, once you see that and you catch that glimpse of that glory at the cross, then you can understand what an incredible king Jesus is as he's coming into Jerusalem. And who are we? We are the people he rescues. We are, we are the sheep that survives. We are the seed that lives. We are the ones who inherit eternal life because our great King stood in our place. So when we wave palm branches, when we cry Hosanna, we are not wondering anymore if God will save. We actually know that this King is the one who does save us. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So what then for us? What, how do we respond to this? Um, what, what, what word does Jesus have for us, the people who recognize in his death the hour of his glory? Well, Jesus has a word for us here, doesn't he? Have a look with me. Verse 26. Whoever serves me, the way you serve a king, must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. That's his promise. The Father will honor the one who serves me. See, there are many things that we want to go about and do in our life. I understand that. We want to travel. We want to have a job. We want to have a career. We want to buy a house. We want to raise our families. We want to enjoy ourselves. But if Jesus is our king, then the primary trajectory of our life must be to serve him. So what's the protocol for that? What does it look like for us to follow him? 
That's a huge question. One will take many sermons to truly unpack. But I want to ask you, are you ready to do it? Are you ready to walk this pathway of following Jesus, no matter where it takes you? No matter what difficult decisions you need to make along the way? No matter how tough it gets? Are you prepared to do that? So how do we follow him? Well, we need to do what he says. We follow his orders. We rely on him to protect us. He's the good king who does all these things. And we also need to help one another along the way. We need each other. We're part of a crowd, aren't we? We're part of a crowd. And we need to support one another. And one way that we follow Jesus is to help one another to hear what Jesus says and to obey him. And that can sometimes be pretty difficult because life can be very, very challenging for us and we need to be people who help each other. You might like to imagine, just for a moment, that, uh, that uh, we're, a, we're a group of soldiers. We're walking through a muddy swamp. It's called life. And you know, there are mozzies there, and they annoy you, and there's your swatting flies, and there, you're in heavy boots, and the rain keeps on you know, showering down on you. Anyway, you're pushing your way through this mud, you know, and you know where you're going to get to, and you know what's ahead of you, but it's hard. But you do know what you need to do. But as you pull through the mud, you see some of your mates struggling alongside you. What do you do? Well, you help them out because no one gets left behind. You encourage him. Say, come on, mate. I'm here with you. I'll walk with you. I'll carry you. I'll share what I have with you. I want you to be there with me at the end because I know where Jesus has taken us. And that's what we do. So brothers and sisters, all saints, we need each other if we're going to follow Jesus as individuals. We need each other to support one another. We need to follow Jesus well together. And it's, and it's important because we realize that following Jesus, is no, we're, not, we're not called to an easy life. Right? It's not an easy life. No comfortable sofa on a life following Jesus. Jesus warns us. He says it's going to be hardship along the way. You're going to make difficult decisions. You may suffer persecution for your faith. There are all sorts of challenges ahead of us. So we need one another. And so Jesus calls us together and he says, support one another, encourage one another, love one another, serve one another. And that's how you'll serve me. And that's a great thing, isn't it? That's why it's so important to be part of a church. Because we need one another. And because we all have something we can use to contribute to the lives of the people around us. And that's why we want to use the different gifts that God's given us. We want to serve one another well. And I think a great church community is one where that happens. But there's a little trap for us sometimes as well. A little trap that happens. And I, I see this occasionally. And that is that sometimes when we serve other people, we do so not so much to serve their needs, but actually we do it to meet some need within ourselves. We do it sometimes to serve ourselves. It's a subtle thing, but it can happen really easily. You find your gift in leadership, in preaching, in hospitality, in music, and you think, I'm going to use this gift to serve this congregation, this group of people. I'm going to use this gift to serve these people, and you do a good job. Maybe you get encouraged by others. That was fantastic what you did there. You get praise for what you did. Wow, you're really good at that. And after a while, you begin to serve for the sake of that praise for the sake of that spotlight, for the sake of that encouragement. And your service of others, the use of your gifts, actually becomes a way for you to feel better about yourself. It's a subtle difference, but it's really easy to fall into. Spotlights can be very seductive. So what do we do if we notice this in ourselves? Because it's hard to understand exactly, and sometimes we have conflicted motives, I recognise that. I think we've just got to go back to understanding and keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus and the way that he serves us. When we see Jesus as our king, the one who humbled himself, he didn't just tell us to be humble, he was humble. Dying on a cross, he did that to serve us utterly and completely. And that means that when we have that mentality of serving others, there will be menial, humble, unseen tasks that we will do because we don't care about the praise, the spotlight or the glamour. But we care about supporting our mates who are struggling in the mud. 
So we fix our eyes on Jesus and we serve the needs of others. That's part of how we follow Jesus together. Well, we don't get a chance to start our lives all over again and perhaps if you're anything like me, you can list all the mistakes that you've made and you perhaps feel sadness and regret over the decisions that you've made in your life and maybe sometimes you feel as if you've failed at almost everything you've tried to do as our mate Neil felt. But you know what, folks? We are never out of hope. We are always the hopeful people because our success depends on what Jesus has already done for us through his death on the cross and his resurrection to eternal life. So that gives us great freedom with the decisions that we make. So let's make the next decision that we make today, this week, be one that says yes to Jesus as we follow him wherever he leads us. And you know what, folks, if the TV cameras come to visit you guys, maybe they turn up here in another seven years' time, see how things are gone, how have you gone, all saints, at following Jesus together, I hope they find a church that's strong, that's encouraging of one another, that uses their words to build others up, that serves others for the sake of others, learning, growing, believing together, encouraging one another for the sake of the gospel, that we might all get to the end together and meet Jesus on that last day. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that on this Palm Sunday we remember Jesus, our King, the one who humbly entered into his city and humbly went to his death, the death that was in our place. Father, we thank you for that death. We thank you that it was a death that took our sin to the cross. And we pray that we might be people who obey Jesus as our King, serve him faithfully by following him. Help us do this well, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you right? Please stand and let's sing. Oh
Just a couple of notices before we, uh, we head off uh, for a cup of coffee outside. Um, a reminder that we've got these little brochures at the, on the desk at the back of the church there in bundles. There are invitations for people around the area to come to our um, Easter services. So please take uh, a bundle of those and drop those in, the, uh, in people's letterboxes that live around near you. That would be great. A uh, reminder for Good Friday, um, please bring along a bag of hot cross buns for Good Friday, that'd be great. And I'm happy to volunteer for quality control, so just bear that in mind. <laughs> uh, reminder two, BCA boxes uh, need to be coming in. Um, and who noticed the new drum kit? Yeah, um, the old one died and it wasn't worth trying to, to re, re, uh, repair. Um, we did salvage the snare drum and the cymbals, um, but the kit that we've got, uh, like that was $2,000. So just when you're doing your offertories, you might just want to think about a couple of extra bucks just to help cover the cost of the drum kit. That'd be great. Th Maundy Thursday service. What time's that? 7pm. 7 7pm, Maundy. OK, so a reminder will go around by email. So 7pm Thursday for a Maundy. Th and it will be a communion service. OK, so that's Maundy Thursday, 7pm communion service. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I think that's all the notices. So let's encourage one another with the words of the grace. I'll come up on the screen for those who don't know them. Uh, this is something we say to one another. So let's encourage one another. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>